Good morning. Uh, here we are in Golden, Colorado. Uh, I'm Jim Halleck, one of the uh, partners in Colorado Earth LLC. My partner Lisa is not here today. However, our right arm, Austin Rodriguez, is here and he's going to make it Hello. all happen for us today. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the rubble trench this morning. It's kind of a misnomer. The rubble uh, doesn't give it a very good name, but in fact, it's gravel, um, is the rubble. And um, it's uh, three, three to three and a half inch minus rock, um, clean, dry. And we, um, we dig a trench and we fill that trench with rubble, i.e. rock, and we compact it. And we do that instead of pouring a lot of concrete filled with rebar into a hole in the ground. Uh, the rubble trench was uh, popularized in this country by Frank Lloyd Wright, a uh, reasonably famous architect who was traveling either in the Mideast or Scotland, I've heard the story two ways, and saw these massive earthen buildings that had been there for centuries and noted that there were no cracks in them and he wondered how they did it. And uh, they said, well, it's quite simple, we built on gravel. And so he brought it back to the States and used it on, on a lot of his houses. The advantage is that it won't crack. Uh, a concrete foundation has to go down below the frost line because the ground will freeze, the frost will heave, and the concrete foundation will crack. Hence, in Colorado, we dig various depths, depending on where you are, between 30 and 50 inches into the ground and fill it with concrete and rebar. We think this is a better system because A, you don't have to build, so, you don't have to dig so deeply and B, and most importantly, it will never crack because it's compacted gravel. The best example I can give of how this works is uh, underneath railroad tracks. When you have those uh, million ton trains rolling over a surface if that surface was concrete, of course, it would crack quickly. But they pack gravel underneath the railroad tracks so that there's some give and there's no cracking. It's the same principle here. The depth of the trench uh, varies depending on where you are, how hard the ground is, and, and how much uh, you really want to get below the frost line. When Frank was checking them out in Scotland, uh, they didn't dig very deep even though there's obviously a frost line there because it was gravel and wouldn't crack. It was their way of, of battling the, uh, the frost line. So we'll, um, I've never been stopped doing this uh, foundation by any building departments, but that doesn't mean that, that you might not have some issues. Uh, but we're doing it here. We did it on uh, Babs, our brick shit house over here, uh, and it will be just fine for for centuries. Uh, that, that particular building has a 12 inch tall stem wall on it. The code is six inches. Uh, we typically do eight. Uh, typically you put a French drain in the bottom of the gravel trench. It's a four inch perforated pipe that runs along the bottom of the trench so that any moisture that does transfer down through the gravel into the French drain and be taken away. Away is either to daylight, if you're on a hill, you can come out to daylight. Or if you're on a flat spot like this, you dig a dry, dry well that the pipe goes into, deep, big hole filled with gravel, and the water goes there. Um, the trench width is six inches wider on each side, so one foot wider than your stem wall. In this case, our stem wall is is 10 inches, so our trench is 22 inches wide. So we have six inches of compacted gravel outside of the, of the grade beam. And then of course it's important on the exterior of any building, no matter what kind of foundation you're doing, to slope the, the grade on the exterior away from the foundation so that water is not directed towards the foundation. So here we are, we have our trench, we've got some gravel in it now, and we'll put a lot more in it now and then compact it. Okay, so we're gonna compact our gravel today with this little hand compactor. Um, 
if you have access to a mechanical one, of course, uh, it's a lot easier. And if you have a choice between um, a thumper, uh, jumping jack type versus the plate compactor, the plate compactor is better uh, to use in the trench because the whacker has a tendency to kick things up on the side, whereas the plate compactor keeps it small. You put your rock in in about six to eight inch lifts, and then you compact it, and then another six to eight inch lift, and you compact it until we get up to grade. When we get up to grade, then we'll put the uh, form boards on so that we can put in the steel rebar and the, the concrete. Okay, so we have our gravel uh, rubble in the trench now, compacted. We're ready to put up the form boards. As I mentioned, these are, this is a 12 inch stem wall. Six, is, six inches is the code minimum. We typically do eight, but these are 12. right there okay I'll hold that while you drive the stake okay, I think we're gonna have to shim this one up right there have at it given that this is a demonstration we went ahead and used this bent board typically you wouldn't do that the form boards are gonna be straight Look at that, perfect. Uh, we put these outriggers on here to hold up the form boards because we're getting the stake out here into solid soil as opposed to the gravel that's compacted in here. Now, if you need more stakes, you can go ahead and drive them into the gravel out here. What you can come up against though when you do this is we have a little bit of concrete running out the bottom here and we like that. Those are little feet on top, on the bottom of this, of this stem wall. They're little footing feet that are going to run out here onto the gravel. That's why we didn't fill the gravel all the way to the top of the, the grade beam. We're going to have some little feet here. So when you put your additional stakes on the outside here to make your forms firm and level, you can run into a situation where the concrete runs out here and gets around the stake makes it very difficult to get out okay the solution to that and we don't have a piece of it here today is just to get some uh, three-quarter inch PVC pipe cut little sleeves out of that put them on the stake and then they would be right here okay so the stake is either in gravel from which we can't extract it or it's nailed into the form board, which of course we can get it loose from there. But to keep it from getting trapped in that concrete, if you just put a little piece of PVC right there so the concrete goes around it, then you can still get the stake out. Okay? All right, so there's our gravel, there's our form boards, and the uh, spreaders. Now we're going to put some spreaders in here. Uh, yeah, okay. We're going to. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> it's easier to put the rebar in before you put the spreaders on, that's for sure. So we're going to lay a couple of sticks of number four in here. And how many sticks and what configuration or whether they have stirrups or not it depends on uh, the situation. With this 12-inch grade beam, we would typically put four sticks in here. We're just demonstrating these two today. So the rebar is laid in there, or your cage, or whatever you're going to do. Then you put spreaders between these boards to maintain your exact 
uh, wall thickness, in this case 10 inches. These spreaders uh, maintain the exact width of the grade beam that we want, which in this case is 10 inches. Um, putting them down in here makes it easy to finish with a trowel when you put the concrete in because you don't have to go underneath them. A lot of guys like to put them on top and that's okay too. Uh, but you have to get underneath it with a trowel to get it smooth. Um, the, when we take these out, we end up with a little divot there, which we can fill with, with mortar. So now we need some uh, tie wire and wire up the rebar. What's important with this rebar um, is to maintain its position in the concrete. You want to make sure you always have complete coverage around the rebar. I think it's two inches off the sides and three inches off the bottom, something like that. And uh, to maintain that, uh, of course we've hung it here so that it's off the sides and we get the coverage. But you can also put these, these cross pieces in there. Or if you're doing a cage with four bars and stirrups, then it stays uh, as it should. But given that we've only got two bars in here and they're kind of swinging around and the concrete's gonna come pouring in here, we wanna maintain them in this position. So we tie wire some cross pieces on here every few feet and, uh, and make sure we, we keep them separated when the concrete goes in the, in the hole, okay? So um, this is it. This is the rubble trench uh, foundation. Uh, the next thing that will happen, which we're not going to do today, is pour concrete in it, since this is sort of a dummy demo model. But we had this set up on BABs all the way around, and then we poured in the concrete. When you pour in the concrete, you want to make sure you vibrate it or stab it so that you don't have any rock pockets. Uh, you also tap on the side of the form boards, which will bring the slurry next to the edge and won't leave rock pockets showing in your in your grade beam or bond beam or whatever you're pouring. So vibrating and tapping is, is real important to make sure you get complete coverage with the concrete and that you're not showing rock pockets when you pull the forms off. Okay, questions? That's it.